A huge thanks to Brian for sponsoring this video. Good morning, fellow mathematicians! Welcome back to another video. We are going to do an integral today, namely an infinitely nested one. We are going to evaluate the integral of the sine 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 of blah 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 up until infinity x. Might sound weird, might look kind of weird, but we have dealt with infinitely nested radicals or just infinitely recursive functions before inside of integrals. And this is not the only one that we are going to take a look at. We are going to take a look at four or five other ones today and I hope you are going to enjoy the video and now we are going to dive right in. So the main procedure of evaluating something like this is to take a look at the function on the inside at first. Let us adopt some different kind of notation here just to make things easier for us. Since we are infinitely nesting signs, this is like an in infinite composition of functions you could say. We are going to denote such compositions with, with a sign for example and a little infinity down here. Okay, Just to make our life easier such that we don't need to write everything out once again. So this right here is sine infinity of x dx. And how would you evaluate something like this? Well, we are going to rewrite our integrand right here a tiny little bit. We are going to find out to which value this right here is going to converge. It might sound weird and counterintuitive since we have an unknown in here, basically x, which we are going to integrate with respect to. But actually, infinitely recursive functions like these mostly converge to some kind of value that we can actually evaluate. And that's what we are going to do now. So at first we are going to let our function that we got in here be equal to some other function with respect to x. Let's, let's call it t for example. So let sine infinity of x be equal to t. Now I want you guys to note something, to notice something. Namely, since our infinite recursion of signs that we got here is equal to t, what would happen if I were to cover up the first sign that we got here? I mean, we still have an infinite recursion of signs in here once again. So if we were to cover up the first sign that we got here, what we got inside of parentheses is still our function t. Meaning sine infinity of x being equal to t does also imply if it converges to a certain value that the sine of t is equal to t. I hope you could follow me there. Okay, see? This is the sine of the sine of the sine blah blah blah. So if we were to just take a look at what we got in the first parentheses right here, this is the sine of the sine of the sine blah blah blah, which is still our function t yet again. Meaning our constant that we need to get or our recursion in the limit needs to satisfy this equation right here, namely that the sine of t is equal to t. We know by the fundamental theorem of engineering that this right here always holds true. But let's get away from the fundamental theorem of engineering and let's talk about real math right here. When does sine of t equal to t hold? Well, this obviously only holds for t being equal to zero. If we take a look at the graph of the sine, zero is only being hit at the sine of zero. Okay, meaning this equation right here is going to be satisfied or rather our infinite recursion of signs is going to converge to zero overall. So what we are going to evaluate here is just the indefinite integral over zero integrate with respect to x. Now you might say, well, this right here is just zero. No, it's not. This is also a trap that many calculus students fall into at first. This right here is just going to evaluate to some kind of constant, okay? This is zero times x plus some constant since it's an indefinite integral. Meaning this right here is just some arbitrary constant c and then we are done. Now the same thing holds for an integral of the form tangent of the tangent of the tangent blah 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 up until infinity of x. So what we have to happen if we take a look at tangent infinity of x integrated with respect to x. Now once again we can go through the very same procedure. What you're always going to notice is that if we let tangent of infinity of x be equal to t, then you're going to notice that the tangent of the tangent of the tangent blah 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 is in the first parentheses yet again. Meaning our integrand right here needs to satisfy the following equation. That the tangent of t is equal to t. It's always the same observation that you can take right here. Now, what is the tangent again? Let us think. The tangent is nothing other than the sine divided by the cosine. So this right here is the sine of t divided by the cosine of t. 
Now this right here needs to hold. Now if you take a look at our t that we got right here, t is the same thing as t over 1. And if we just assume that the GCD of t and 1 is going to be 1, okay, then what we are going to get is if we compare numerator and denominator that t must be equal to the sine of t and cosine of t must be equal to 1. This obviously only holds if t is equal to 0 yet again. So meaning these two integrals that we got here, these two spicy individuals actually got the same value, namely some arbitrary constant c. Isn't that kind of cool? Now here comes a very very interesting one which I'm going to make several videos on later because it's not a trivial matter to be honest. Namely what about the little cousin? <laughs> that was actually a good one. Cosine cousin. I hope you can see what I did there. Um, just infinitely nested. So cosine infinity of x dx. Once again, same procedure. We are going to notice that the cosine of t must be equal to t. And when this right here is satisfied, we know what the integrand is going to be. And this right here might seem kind of curious to the mathematicians um, among you, uh, among us, <laughs> among us. Because if you take a look at the Taylor series expansion of the cosine, you're going to notice the following. The Taylor series expansion of the cosine says that the cosine can be expressed as 1 minus t squared over 2 factorial plus t to the fourth power over 4 factorial negative and so on. All the even exponents divided by the even factorials. Now what can you see here if you compare these two polynomials? Well, we don't have a t to the first power term in here, meaning it seems kind of unusual that a so-called fixed point should exist for the cosine of t. But there actually does and I'm going to make several more videos on this special number. This thing that is going to satisfy the fixed point the equation cosine of t being equal to t is called Dotty's number. Okay? This is called the Dotty number and we are going to denote the Dotty number by r t must be equal to r, the so-called dotting number, to... <laughs> it's a cool number, okay? It's, it's, it's rather hard to find out what it actually is. It converges to something very slowly. You need to use um, the Lagrange inversion um, theorem for that. But yeah, Dotty's number is going to satisfy this fixed point equation, meaning this is going to result in r times x plus some arbitrary constant c. This is the cosine, infinitely nested and thus an integral. Pretty good, right? Now, next up is something that might come to your mind next, namely the exponential function. What about the infinitely nested exponential function? So x infinity of x integrate with respect to x. If we were to, to write this out, it would look kind of funny because this would be like the power tower e to the e to the blah blah blah, somewhere x up there. I don't know where it is, but somewhere at infinity there is an x. And then integrate with respect to x. Now once again, it needs to satisfy the following equation. e to the t must be equal to t. Now this right here is actually kind of curious. If you take a look at the Taylor series expansion, you can actually find out a certain Taylor polynomial for um, the solution to this equation right here. But we can do better than that using the so-called Lambert W function. I want you guys to recall what Lambert W function is. You can find several links down there in the description. Namely, if we take a look at the following function, f of x being equal to um, x times e to the x, there does exist an inverse on the principal branch and also on the other complex branches which we can find out the x value with. It's the so-called Lambert W function and the Lambert W function is the local inverse, namely f of Lambert W of z is going to give us the z value since it's the inverse function so the function of the inverse function is also the same of the inverse function of the function giving us z and this is equal to Lambert W of z times e to the Lambert W of z. Or we can go the other way around as mentioned. So Lambert W of the function with respect to z is going to give us the z value yet again since it's the inverse function and this is going to be the same as the Lambert W of um, z times e to the z. Okay, this is something that we can do and now we need to bring it into the form x times e to the x in some kind of way such that we can make use of the Lambert W function on both sides. Now what we are going to do is we are going to multiply both sides by e to the negative t because it's not equal to zero exponential function doesn't go to zero other than in the limit. Now what we are going to get is that 1 is equal to t times e to the negative t. Now we are going to do a simple change of variable namely 
let, um, let's go with my, my most favorite Greek letter, namely eta, be equal to negative t. If we were to substitute this in, we're going to get that 1 is equal to negative eta times e to the eta. Multiplying both sides by negative 1 is going to give us negative 1 is equal to eta times e to the eta. Now we can make use of the Lambert W function because it's right in this form right here. Namely, by applying the Lambert W function on both sides, we are going to get that Lambert W of negative 1 is equal to, well, eta. This is what we want to have. We want to find out what the eta value is on our equation that we got right here. So eta. But eta has been nothing other than negative t. Meaning the solution to this equation that we got right here is that um, t is equal to negative lambda w of negative 1 on the principal branch and all the other um, natural number indexed branches if I'm not mistaken. Meaning the solution to our integral that we got up here is going to be negative lambda w of negative 1 times x plus some arbitrary constant c. And I leave it as an exercise to the viewer to determine what the infinitely nested radical of the natural logarithm of x is. Okay? I leave it as a little exercise to the viewer. Also, you can try it out with other functions. What about the inverse trigonometric function? What about the hyperbolic functions? What about the hover sine, hover cosine, co hover cosine functions, for example? If you don't know what it is, link to those also in the description. And I hope you did enjoy what you have seen today. And if you want to see more integrals, infinitely nested radicals, things about recursion, maybe you haven't heard about this topic before at all, then I invite you to try out the content of today sponsor brain into a kind of sponsor yet now video here on this channel. Infinity is a big theme all throughout mathematics. It's, an, it's a very abstract concept. It's something that you don't really find out there in the real world. But using mathematics, the language of mathematics at least, we can make sense of infinities using calculus for example. Recursions, we can find out what infinitely recursive functions are going to add up to in the limit. And it's also a big theme over on Brilliant. Brilliant is going to deal with a lot of infinite topics over on their website, be it in algebra on infinite fields, linear algebra 2, calculus, analysis, geometry on infinite fractals, which are also just recursive functions being basically um, visualized, you could say. All of this can be found over on Brilliant in their absolutely amazing courses, which are highly interactive and going to give you a very intuitive explanation to most topics that I just told you about. Especially their geometry courses are highly visualized, be it the Koch snowflake, which you can zoom into and just see what all the recursive steps are going to lead up to in this fractal behavior overall. And also talking about infinite fields and just the algebra behind all of these structures. It's well explained over on Brain, and their courses have been created by experts in their field. And it's really something where you learn a lot of new stuff from, if you ask me. I for myself actually learned a lot of new things over on Brilliant, be it on Markov chains and other topics in analysis, multivariable calculus. I learned on Brilliant about topics like these. And if you also want to learn about new topics that you haven't learned about before, then I invite you to try out Brilliant today too by using the link at the top of the description, Brilliant.org slash Maths. With it, you are going to get free access to a big portion of Brilliant already, but the first 200 people to actually make use of the link get 20% of an annual premium subscription, which is a really great deal considering how much content they have available on their website already. So definitely make sure and check it out and support the channel this way. And if you did enjoy this video, then definitely also make sure to subscribe to the channel as well as to share the videos around. This really helps the channel out a lot. Comment down there, like the comment, etc. And not a comment, like the video, please. And until the next video, I wish you guys a flamble day. Don't forget to check out Stemmerge EU2 for handcrafted stem products. And I bid you farewell. Please stay safe. Ciao.